Hello, my name's Elijah Wells, and today I'm doing my favourite films of all time list. As in, I've been doing this uh, YouTube thing for now nearly a decade now, and I've got I've reached 70 subscribers, and I thought, why not? Uh, I haven't done my favourite films of all time list, so why not do it now? So here's my list. But first off, some honourable mentions, as in films that are basically 10 out of 10, but didn't necessarily uh, round up to my top 25 films, uh, my personal taste of all time. But here's the honourable mentions. My Left Foot, Pan's Labyrinth, Fargo, Goodfellas, and Everything Everywhere All At Once. And now, time for the main feature. At number 25, we have The Rocky Horror Picture Show. I've seen this at, at uni twice, as in one when studying cult film and one when uh, there was this old debate called old society called film debate where we uh, watched it as for cult cinema like, as in I I I brilliantly understand why people would go back to watch it like this movie is like uh, something you can cosplay to something you can sing along to something you can dance along to it's just like a unbelievably camp one of the most unbelievably joyful uh, one of the most silly and one of the most fun films I've ever uh, watched like Tim Curry just absolutely uh, stole the role. Like Doctor Franken uh, Scott uh, as basically this uh, cr uh, cross-dressing uh, uh, Frankenstein um, scientist. Uh, but again, and his Frankenstein creation is this very beautiful blonde man. Again, this movie is just uh, just so much fun. At number twenty-four, it's Apocalypse Now. I've, yeah, when it comes to like Francis Ford Coppola movies. A lot of people would say, uh, The Godfather is better and Godfather 2, but in my opinion, Apocalypse Now it is his best movie. It is such a, one of the most gorgeously shot movies, one of the most meditative movies out there, in my opinion. And it's definitely one, one more psychological and bit, some of a mind bender, in, in my opinion. I've only seen the uh, theatrical cut, which is like two and a half hours long, and the Redux version, which came out in I think 2001 or 2002, which goes on for three uh, hours and 15 minutes or something like that. Uh, but I haven't got around to seeing the final cut, which just goes around for a solid three hours. But I think uh, uh, both, both versions that I've seen are actually really brilliant. Uh, Martin Sheen is actually really good in the movie. Martin Brando is great in the movie. Harvey Keitel, Harrison Ford is extremely brief appearance in the movie, and Robert Duvall is also a spectacular in the movie. The cinematography is brilliant, the music is also great, the action is absolutely mind blowing, and the ending is just really rattles you to the core if you think about it uh, uh, back and forth onto it. And again, I think uh, when it comes to epic, uh, Epic films, particularly in the Vietnam War, I think uh, Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now really does take the crown. And at number 23, it's Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Even though the movie does not unfortunately take place in Brazil, it does take place in an allegorical futuristic setting, which is very reminiscent of the Margaret Thatcher era of Britain. Again, like a lot of uh, Terry Gilliam films, the movie is absolutely weird and designs are absolutely unparalleled. Uh, the performance of Jonathan Price in the movie is actually brilliant. The the movie visually is very gorgeous just to look at, and the music is also super good. And the ending is just one of the most shocking things I've probably seen. Like I was just like quiet, like after the ending came out. There was also people like Nostalgia Critic who said this is his favorite film of all time. Brilliant choice, but don't do music again. And Mark Hermode, I think, put on his top ten of. I'm not sure if it's favorite films of all time or the greatest films of all time since he has two separate lists but again uh, this is uh, a really good choice uh, of film uh, particularly from a guy who did like 12 Monkeys, Fair and Lovely in Las Vegas and he also helped out with Marcy Python so again very, futu uh, very futuristic and very weird and very gorgeous as well and just uh, one of the most mind, ba mind bending satires of like Contemporary Britain that uh, was released in 1985, uh, particularly as a hardcore mockery of uh, Thatcher, who was basically now perceived more and more as a dictator. Uh, to come to, can't think about it. At number 22, it's a hero from 2002, uh, 
which is filmed from China. Uh, it's from the same director, uh, Shang Yimou, who did The House of Flying Daggers, which is also a brilliant movie. And also another film I really like from him, uh, being his earlier films, The Red Sugar, where uh, it's definitely a lot more darker and a lot more politically charged at best. But uh, for my opinion, Hero is his best movie. Like, uh, this movie, if I have a chance to see it on a big screen, I would uh, uh, see it on a big screen, no question asked. Like, the acting in this movie is amazing, the atmosphere is absolutely uh, uh, fropping leak, and the cinematography is beautiful. The music is also great, the design, both costume and uh, sets are amazing, and particularly, uh, it's just a, a, such a one of the most visually gorgeous movies out there. Like, I think even the Simpsons movie did like an homage to it with that famous shot of like the arrows, like a whole like hundreds and hundreds of arrows and this one man just standing there in the middle. Uh, I, I think the uh, Simpsons movie just really did pay homage to that. Like, that movie is just unimmaculately, just immaculate. And at number 21, it's Downfall. Well, the movie is basically about Adolf Hitler's uh, final days uh, uh, as leader of, of Germany before uh, the, uh, the World War II would eventually come to an end and he would eventually commit suicide. Again, this movie is not for everyone, particularly the movie did garner some controversy when it came out for humanising was essentially one of the most evil people to ever crawl onto this earth. But a uh, uh, but Bruno Gantz's performance is absolutely brilliant, uh, playing basically one of the most despicable human beings to uh, ever to ever exist. Uh, again, the writing is actually brilliant. Uh, the acting of Bruno Gantz, who unfortunately passed away recently, he is absolutely he does a show-stopping performance as Adolf Hitler in this movie. The movie itself is really dark as well, uh, particularly with Hitler questioning his mortality and kind of accepting the fact that he's pretty much lost a war and there's no way out, uh, out of it and there's no way to salvage it. Again, if you're a history buff like me, just uh, give it a check out, that, the movie Downfall. For number 20, it's Children of Men by Alfonso Cuaron. Yeah, there's a lot of good Alfonso Cuaron movies, but I think Children of Men is my favourite film from him. Yes, uh, Why To My Mama To Be Arm is also a great movie. Prisoner Azkaban is my favourite Harry Potter movie, uh, back when uh, J.K. Rowling wasn't a transphobic Karen. Uh, Gravity is also really good as well. And so is the Netflix film he did, Roma, which is surprisingly really good. Uh, but in my opinion, Children of Men is my favourite film from him. Uh, again, the movie uh, has been used quite a lot uh, back in 2016, where, was, where the movie kind of seen it as, as a more of a a warning about the age of Trump and the age of Brexit. The movie itself is like extremely dark, has one of the most fantastic uh, third acts out there. The music is unbelievably grim, the tone and the atmosphere is absolutely dark. Again, I think in my opinion, films like Prisoner, Azkaban and Roma, I think the darker storylines kind of work to Alfonso Cuaron's advantage, uh, particularly in the movie Children of Men. At number 19, it's Amadeus. It's directed by uh, Miles Fullman, who directed One Flew Over the Cuckoo Nest, and one of the handful of directors to have uh, not one but two Best Pictured winning uh, films uh, under his canon. Again, this is basically a really intense uh, rivalry uh, film, and it's also a really great performance of F. Mary May Abraham, which I think did win him an Oscar in the movie, and also a great performance of Mozart Amadeus, who is also a really uh, uh, childishly crude but also brilliant at the same time. The Design of the movie, both costume and sets, uh, reminiscent of the uh, of the respective time period, is absolutely gorgeous, and the music is absolutely brilliant. Given that it's mostly Mozart music, and what to say, it's definitely not too uh, too many notes, uh, as it's the movie has a right about of notes. Uh, if we're talking about like musical composition, even though I'm not too great with musical uh, writing music, but I'm. Trying to take a piano, but uh, this movie is absolutely brilliant. So, at number 18, it's Star Wars Return of the Jedi from 1983. Again, yes, people are going to say, No, New Hope is a better film. No, it's uh, Empire Strikes Back is a better film. But again, this is a more of a controversial opinion. But I think uh, Return of the Jedi is the best out of the original trilogy. Uh, even though. Um, 
I kind of understand uh, the sequel trilogy, why people like it, but uh, it's not too uh, great in my opinion, but uh, sequel trilogy, uh, it started off good until it just kind of fell apart uh, when I kind of fall back on it, uh, particularly in Rise of Skywalker, but again, it's basically Luke Skywalker basically reconciling with his father, Darth Vader, which, and also Palpatine's in this movie, and the music, uh, the movie visually is absolutely amazing, the battle scenes are brilliant, and and the cinematography, is, as for this one, is actually really good. Uh, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford do some great performances in this movie. Again, I feel like this is probably the more sentimental of the entire trilogy, and probably the most poignant of the entire trilogy, uh, which is why Return of the Jedi is my favourite Star Wars film. At number 17, it's Grave of the Fireflies. Again, I've seen this movie at, as 25th anniversary screening, which is a decade ago now. Which, uh, think of it now, the movie is like 35 years old now. Uh, the movie is directed by Isao Takato, who did Tell the Princess Kaguya and Only Yesterday. The movie itself is extremely depressing, extremely dark, as it basically uh, follows two kids uh, trying to survive, uh, uh, trying to survive mostly on their own during the last days of World War II. Again, uh, the animation is absolutely good, absolutely brilliant in this movie. The music is top notch, and th and the movie itself is pretty grim. So, even even though I like everything Studio Ghibli uh, done, I think this, uh, just in my opinion, it's my favorite. It's a Takahata movie. Uh, I think Tale of Princess Kaguya is a very close second. Again, uh, I did see this again on the big screen during its 25th anniversary screening, and when it came out on Blu-ray, I think. But again, I did see it with my dad, and we were just utterly speechless. Like we had initially had no idea what to make of the film. Like it was pretty bleak. The movie again, it's uh, definitely uh, uh, one of one of the greatest movies out there. One of the greatest animated films again to ever exist. At number sixteen, it's Blade Runner. Uh, again, this is my favorite Ridley Scott movie. Uh, a very close second is Gladiator with Russell Crowe in the movie and I can't wait for a sequel to come out I think next year or year after depending on how the strikes are going to go off but uh, the movie it's, uh, itself is very sentimental and very existential at best the movie visually is absolutely stunning and really ahead of its time the music even though I actually have the CD of it uh, uh, right here uh, which is absolutely gorgeous just, you know, I probably just overused the word gorgeous way too many times, but uh, Van Gallus, who unfortunately recently passed away, uh, I think this is uh, the, the more iconic soundtrack than, uh, let's say, Chariots of Fire, in my opinion. Uh, and also, uh, 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 the, mo the movie's concepts are bl brilliant, uh, the love of cinematography is absolutely stunning, I just... Uh, the movie is just one of the most uh, aesthetically pleasing movies out there. And what do I think about the sequel, even though I've done a review of it? Again, a brilliant movie, 2049, starring Ryan Gosling and directed by Denis Villeneuve, but for my money, the original is still my favourite. And for number 15, it's Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Rings. Like, uh, this is just a really great movie. Like, uh, the more I watch this movie, the better the movie is. Like, like, this is like a, what an epic supposed to be, what a fantasy movie is supposed to be. Like, this is like the textbook example of how to make uh, an epic in this modern, in this modern contemporary age. Like, Peter Jackson, who was uh, uh, at that point before Lord of the Rings, was a, a very niche film director who did Brain Dead, Meet the Feebles. Uh, again, some uh, relatively uh, uh, artsy, uh, relatively... Uh, quirky stuff they did in his native country of New Zealand, then he made an entire trilogy filmed back to back over the course of like a year or a half or two years, costed like uh, $300 million for the entire trilogy, so roughly $100 million per film, and three hours each, excluding uh, the extended run times, and you have what's essentially one of the most brilliant and one of the most breathtaking, one of the most awe-aspiring epics out there, and I think... Uh, they're all brilliant, but if I have to choose at gunpoint, I think it's Fellowship of the Ring, the first one. And for number 14, it's Shawshank Redemption. Uh, no wonder this movie has been on the number one for IMDb's Top 250 for like several years now. Like, this movie had to be really good, and of course, the movie is really, really, really good. 
again. Uh, Tim uh, Robbins, who is a super underrated actor, is absolutely uh, amazing in his role. So is Morgan Freeman. Uh, again, uh, it's not from uh, an Oscar win, but again, it was a pretty packed year with like Samuel L. Jackson in uh, in Pulp Fiction, and there was uh, Armand Landau from Ed Wood, which was a really great film as well. But uh, uh, again, Short Redemption has uh, some great music some great cinematography, some great performances, some great writing, and brilliant direction by Frank Durabont, who is, who is known for directing films like Green Mile and The Mist, who are both Stephen King uh, uh, novels originally, so is Short Tank Redemption, but he's also well known for being the executive producer of the famous AMC TV show, The Walking Dead, so the more you know. All right, at number 13, it's Leon the Professional, even though it's very difficult to defend Lupusson, given that he's a very creepy pervert, and the origins of the movie had did raise some uh, really uh, speculative questions, but in my opinion, Leon is still one of my favourite films of all time, and also one of the best films from the action genre as well. Again, it's also Natalie Portman's debut film, so there's that, and she is uh, one of the best child uh, performances uh, I've probably ever seen, like, ever, like, she is absolutely brilliant in this movie, like, you can tell in the long run, uh, yeah, uh, she, she does improve, like, even though you, you can uh, improve from, like, golden performances, but her, her work just gets better and better, like, Annihilation, there's the, she was the best thing in the prequels, uh, Star Wars prequels, if she won for Black Swan, again, she was absolutely brilliant in this movie, and Jean Reno, who was absolutely a complete, uh, he was absolutely brilliant in this movie. Gary Oldman is an absolute show stealer in this movie. Again, I do like uh, Lu Luce Besson's other movie, The Fifth Element, which I actually did watch a lot of as a kid, and when you get a conversation uh, like Fifth Element around, that uh, people will have like really different opinions, but for Leon Professional, people would usually say it's like one of the best action movies out there, period. We're halfway there, or we're over halfway there, and at number 12 is The Matrix by the Wachowski sisters. Uh, again, uh, people in cells will say this is their favourite movie, even though I'm very certain they've never seen a movie. But, again, uh, The Matrix does uh, 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 some incredible visual effects, some Brilliant set design. Carrie Ann Moss is absolutely brilliant in this movie, and Keanu Reeves is absolutely uh, great in this movie. And so is Lawrence Fishburne in this movie as well. The Wachowski sisters uh, essentially uh, said in a recent interview that the movie is essentially a trans allegory about uh, them uh, coming to realizing that they're trans. Uh, even though I kind of took on a more of a uh, more lenient. Uh, reading of the Matrix, like it's an allegory of like the Plato's Cave, which is something you should really read about, and it's also an idea that you really do not have to uh, conform. Like uh, something is just like making you, forcing you to conform. Like uh, not in a way that it's like conspiratorial or anything, or something like incels kind of like brag about without necessarily uh, uh, understanding it in the sense of a, a word, but. The movie is just an absolute feast for my eyes. It's still really groundbreaking and still really holds on even to this day. Like a lot of people uh, like me still love the movie. Uh, and again, uh, I do like uh, the Wachowski sisters' other movies like uh, Cloud Atlas, which is also really good. But in my opinion, The Matrix from 1999 is still my favorite. At number 11, it's Braveheart by Mel Gibson. Even though it's now really difficult to defend Mel Gibson, given that he's an anti-Semite, but again, this movie is absolutely amazing. Like, it still really uh, holds up to this day, despite some uh, inaccuracies here and there. But the movie itself, particularly in the battle scenes and the fight scenes, and uh, particularly uh, the acting of Mel Gibson, is actually really great in this movie. The cinematography is so so good in this movie costume movie work and the music is brilliant in the movie, like, uh, he does uh, do some uh, other historical epics uh, down the line with, with the controversial Passion of Christ and Apocalypto or something like Hacksaw Ridge which was actually a really brilliant movie. But again, my favourite Mel Gibson movie, uh, both as, a, as an actor and as a director, is uh, Braveheart, even though uh, the original Mad Max trilogy is also like super brilliant as well. Again, 
if you haven't seen Brave already, please check it out right now. Now we enter the top 10 of my favourite films of all time. And number 10, it's Forrest Gump by uh, Robert Zemeckis. Again, Tom Hanks is, delivers, in my opinion, his best performance uh, in any film he did in Forrest Gump. Again, pretty much is uh, a fictional person's life story. Like, it is so extremely expansive and extremely rich in his texture. And it's pretty much so much in his life uh, goes on both positively and negatively that it kind of uh, almost feels awe-inspiring at best. Again, other Robert Smex's films, uh, like Back to the Future, is also a, a, a very close contender in this movie. But again, there was this phase throughout the 2000s where he was so obsessed with motion capture animation, both Tom Hanks and Robert Smex's, and we can all agree it's pretty creepy. But again, I think this is just so much joy coming out of Forrest Gump, even though a lot of people see it as a sad movie. Just, it's basically a very simple movie about a man's life story, uh, a man who may appear ordinary to a, uh, to anyone, but he's just a very extraordinary person uh, the more you get to know him. It's just like a man you meet on a bus stop or a man you meet in a pub. Like, the more, the more time you get invested into their life story, the more it feels rewarding. And number nine, it's Aeroplane by the Sucker Brothers. Again, this movie is just the most uh, hilarious movie out there. It's just so many... Uh, so many good jokes get thrown around, like four throw breaks, like literal uh, jokes, uh, literal jokes, and uh, background jokes, and just every joke you can imagine. It's just so brilliantly executed. Yes, the Naked Gun films uh, from the uh, same directors are also brilliant, and Leslie Nielsen is absolutely brilliant. Like, he started off like a dramatic actor, but uh, when, when he appears in uh, films like this and the Naked Gun films, like, he was... Uh, pretty much in his A game, like, I think comedy was definitely his true calling. Like, uh, this is, in my opinion, one of the best comedies out there, which basically is a Mickey take of the 70s disaster movie tropes. Uh, I think it was taking place, uh, uh, basically, in, uh, mostly in an airplane, and also it took a Mickey out of the 70s movie uh, Airplane, uh, something, a film that came out somewhere in the 70s, but... This movie just uh, gives you laughs no matter how many uh, times you uh, repeatedly watch it and to the point uh, that me and my siblings do a quote of but it's mostly of uh, the pilot's uh, really creepy conversation with a kid like do you, So, do you like gladiators? So, have you ever hang out in a uh, in gym or gymnasium or bars? So, have you ever been to a Turkish prison? And at one certain line I don't want to be uh, uh, be printed out of context instead uh, our fears that it could be using it could be used in the future or I could get demonetized but again airplane a brilliant comedy at number eight it's a Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet a brilliant performance by Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio uh, and made around the time when Leonardo DiCaprio was interested in women his age and also the soundtrack uh, the movie it which is super underappreciated there's uh, Young Hearts Run Free, which is also good, and uh, Everybody's Free is also a brilliant song, and even the Radi Radiohead's uh, very uh, underrated song, Talk Show Host, which was a B-side for Street Spirit Fade Out, is also actually brilliant, so much so, I was actually introduced to Radiohead through uh, this movie. Again, uh, as I was actually listening to uh, that song on repeat uh, when I first watched that film uh, while in secondary school, uh, as we were all learning about the wonders of Shakespeare literature, and this movie was basically used as an example, even though it takes place uh, in uh, contemporary times, but it's really mid-90s, what looks like California, Florida, Mexico, maybe? Again, the movie is, again, super brilliant and very stylish as well, almost Tarantino-esque, uh, in my opinion, and it's just... Uh, a very colourful movie and very flamboyant, uh, quite just basically like uh, what you would expect from a Baz Luhrmann movie. At number seven, it's Tom Hooper's King's Speech. Again, his most recent film, Cats, was just not that great, uh, but also he did do Danish Girl, Damn United and Le Mis, which does indi implicate that he's definitely a bit of a theatre kid growing up. But it, does, it definitely does show, particularly how they stage scenes and particularly how it's performed, like it's basically almost like a theatre production. Uh, Joffrey Rush and also there's Colin Farrell and Helen Bonacarta who are absolutely brilliant in this movie as uh, basically 
uh, a reluctant King George VI uh, reluctantly takes on the throne in the, uh, with World War II pretty much on the horizon and he must lead the country uh, and keep the morale up whether he liked it or not. Again, I think this is uh, Tom Hooper playing at each and every of his strengths and playing off the actor's strengths and the cinematography is actually really gorgeous and also a very interesting trivia uh, tidbit that uh, the opening scene where it was supposedly filmed at the old Wembley Stadium, it was actually filmed at Ellen Road. Uh, uh, how do I know that? It's just because my dad's a Leeds United supporter, so there's that. And also, uh, Abbey Cathedral is actually filmed where I live, Ely Cathedral. So it's actually filmed near where I live, so there's also that coming for it. And at number six is Avatar by James Cameron. Okay, like, before you call me out being a bit of a normie, like, Oh, you like the uh, high-budget remake of Pocahontas and Days of His Wolves. But I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I understand the criticism, but I this is one of my favourite films growing up as a kid and still one of my favourite films growing up. Again, when it comes to James Cameron movies, I like everything he has done, but it, there's, it, it's either that or The Abyss, which is a very close second. The Abyss being a very close second. But again, I think Avatar is still my favourite James Cameron movie. Uh, Sam Worthington is actually brilliant in this movie. So, so is Aldano in pretty much her break in her breakout performance. It's, uh, completely knocks it out of the park. The music is unbelievably epic. The movie visually is uh, pretty much unrivaled and still holds up really well, surprisingly, even though it came out like 13, 14 years ago now. Like, it's still like super good. Like. Uh, there's a reason why you should never really bet on James Cameron failing because he will succeed no matter what the odds are stacked against him. So much so, the sequel came out uh, like last year and it was still, uh, despite the flaws, it's still uh, really amazing. Just has a big screen movie like, uh, if, en if, en if ever it came out on the big screen like a re release did happen like uh, last year, people would still like flock to cinemas just to check it out like, it is still... Even though people uh, kind of write it off and like, ooh, this and do that, like, it's gonna be that type of movie that'll uh, keep you going back to the cinema to, to, just to watch it on the biggest screen possible. That's what power James Cameron has. And for number five, we're going to dwell into my more recent takes. Well, for number five, it's The Farewell by Yulu Wong. Again, uh, this movie is a bit of a, and uh, will definitely pull out the hard strings. It's basically Aquafina, uh, plays a young adult who basically uh, helps out to stage a wedding for her dying grandmother. Again, this movie is just uh, an emotional roller coaster, and she delivers definitely her best performance out there and she definitely deserved a Golden Globe and I have no idea why this movie was not nominated for the Oscars but even though that year was again really packed but it was still left out which was again super super sad. The the movie itself is just uh, one of the most bittersweet movies uh, you'll you probably ever see. It's just uh, a movie that will uh, give you a lot of tears, either sad tears or happy tears. Uh, this is the power that cinema uh, will definitely guarantee you. Like, this movie is absolutely brilliant. I'm very happy for Lulu Wong because I think it was just announced just today that she has a new series coming out called Expats, which is basically about Hong Kong nationals uh, grappling with a tragedy, even though. Uh, whatever it said on a blurb was sounded a tad vague, but I'm very happy that she uh, didn't meet the fate like Terence Malick or Todd Fields, where she'd go on for like over a decade without any news uh, about uh, what film or series she's doing next, but, uh, but she finally uh, rose from the ashes and uh, uh, will be uh, doing x Pact, which I will be hopefully watching soon. And at number four, it's John Boon Ho's Parasite, which again, it, I think this is my favourite uh, uh, film from him. Uh, even though Snowpiercer is absolutely one of the most jaw-dropping films uh, from him, and definitely one of the more surprising films out there with Chris Evans, uh, with Chris Evans and Tilda Swinton and John Hurt in the movie. But Parasite, I think this is a, 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 a no competition. This is my favourite film. Like this movie, just uh, the more you peel back in the movie the more surprising uh, it is. The more you learn out of this movie, the more brilliant it gets. And the more you rewatch the movie, the more rewarding it gets. Like, this is a gift that keep, just keeps on giving. Like, uh, I think even the uh, pl uh, even the, the plot twist in the movie still really shocks me to this day. And even the basement scene is still 
of uh, one of the most scariest scenes I've pr I've pretty much seen in a very long time, and still uh, to this day a very scary scene. The performance is actually brilliant. The allegories are really on point. The uh, it doesn't uh, go out of the way to become really preachy or anything and become too overly sentimental and too overly politically charged. It's just a movie that everyone can definitely get behind and particularly John Boho's very wholesome speech uh, at the Oscars like uh, when you overcome the subtitles you'll be introduced to better movies and congratulating uh, Martin Scorsese like, uh, for being almost like a mentor uh, towards him as he watched his films when he was in film school. Again. He's such a really nice guy, and he just seems to be a person who uh, uh, really uh, feels like uh, uh, people like him a lot, and it definitely uh, felt warranted for it. And I am definitely cannot wait for his upcoming movie that's coming out next year, Mickey 17, with Robert Pattinson in the movie. The acting in that movie, uh, or Parasite, is uh, brilliant, the writing, directing, the music designs and um, just everything and the political allegoriness of this movie is absolutely top notch. And at number three, it's the Monty Python's Life of Brian by Terry Jones. Again, this movie, uh, the more times I watch it, it just it's a movie that never ever actually gets old at all. The performances from the entire Monty Python crew is actually brilliant. The writing is still really on point even to this day. And and the sets, uh, even though this is uh, the more uh, brilliantly designed of the trilogy, in my opinion, and I, I think in my and also it has, I imagine, I think it had some more budget thrown into it. And um, they definitely used a budget into some good use. Like it isn't trying to go out to be the most epic biblical movie out there, but it's just uh, kind of mocking the uh, the idea of uh, the public's relation to Christianity and the more political, more bureaucratic uh, role in uh, Christianity. Like, the movie is still, you know, a bit scary uh, uh, to think about. Uh, that is still very, very uh, telling for this day and age, in my opinion. Like, even though the movie is still very controversial to this day, and it's so funny it's been banned in Norway, South Africa, Chile, and a lot of Muslim countries, and Singapore, and I think in South Korea as well, uh, the movie is... Although the controversy is somewhat understandable, but the movie is uh, just so, so brilliant. The humour is still on point, and performances, the directing, and the writing, which is all done by the Monty Python crew, it's actually still really good. And number two, it's Christopher Nolan's Inception movie. Yes, the Dark Knight movie is a very close second, and so is his other films like In Interstellar, and his more recent movie, uh, Oppenheimer, which is also really good, which I've always which I've just seen less than a month ago now. But in my opinion, Inception is his best film. Again, an ensemble cast of uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Tom Hardy, Elliot Page, and Maureen Cotinard. They're, and also, uh, Michael Caine is in this movie. Uh, they all turn out uh, uh, some top-notch performances. The movie visually is just so mind-bending. The, the music is uh, surprisingly still iconic. The film, how it's shot, is a very high standard of Christopher Nolan. And I think the movie, uh, plot-wise, is surprisingly simple. And how to follow the movie, the, the amount of times I've rewatched it already, is, again, surprisingly uh, easy to follow if you paid close enough attention and have my sister point it out for you. It's basically how to commit a literal uh, heist within someone's mind and just to plant some ideas to make it seem very organic. Which, again, is uh, super, super brilliant and, and definitely one of the more out there ideas by Christopher Nolan who, let's be honest, is uh, only known for basically out there ideas with a lot of practical effects. Like, uh, when I was uh, on a school holiday in Paris, uh, uh, me and my close friend uh, were, I think we were uh, driving through like uh, near the River Seine and we tried to do like location scouting like oh that was the bridge uh, from Inception, oh that was the corner cafe where everything just exploded, oh it was this and that uh, where it all happened. Again, uh, this was the type of movie that uh, I could easily geek out on uh, if, I, or if I wanted to but again Inception is my favourite Christopher Nolan movie. And my favourite film of all time is Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away. Like, this is, in my opinion, uh, uh, one of the greatest films to be uh, ever released uh, of all time. Like, 
There is no simple debating about it. Even though I personally like everything that Hayao Miyazaki has done, to the point I've basically written uh, an entire dissertation on Howl's Moving Castle uh, when I was in uni. Uh, again, uh, 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 even when you're watching his old stuff uh, for the first time, or if you're watching uh, it again, uh, it just feels so fresh, it just feels so organic. It just is, This is just what Hayao Miyazaki is just all about. Just uh, a person, just a director who uh, pretty much uh, uh, made his mark on animation and he pretty much uh, more than succeeded uh, to the point he's basically almost a god of anime. Like, when the first thing people come to mind, it's films like Akira or Ghost in the Shell, but uh, Spiritual Way, even though it's not just because they're one of the best films from Japan, best anime films, best animated films, but one of the best films, in my opinion, of all time. Yeah, uh, this is uh, just a such a visually animation, uh, just so brilliant, just so unraveled. Like, even my mum uh, even pointed out, you have to be like on a, a certain mindset to think of something like that. Like, it's just such a mind-bogglingly creative movie, both narrative-wise and designs-wise and uh, and set-piece-wise. It's just a brilliant movie, uh, both in and out. This music by Joe Hisashi is absolutely top notch in this. Uh, in this case, even though he does do some top notch music, the animation is absolutely brilliant, and the voice acting is br is uh, uh, pretty much in its A grade. Uh, in its A game, it pretty much it's Miyazaki uh, at his most, uh, in my opinion. Like, he's just uh, uh, saying, oh, you thought Princess Mononoke is my best film ever. Think again. Even though uh, he's a person that could uh, basically bend the entire anime uh, industry uh, at his will. Like, he recently released uh, Boy and Heron, or in its, in, in its native country of Japan, How Do You Live, without any advertisement. Like, uh, he's basically almost like Radiohead. Like, he's the greatest of that medium, like, of film. Where for Radiohead is for music. Uh, he basically, and Lightborn and Her Heron and In Rainbow is basically released without advertisement. So, free real estate. Uh, again, this is the reason why Spirited Away is my all time favourite movie. So, what do you think of my favourite films of all time? I'll let uh, my letterbox uh, list down below. Subscribe to my channel, like this video, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And this is Elijah Wells, and bye.